Lord, we need you. We ask you to be present here with us. Holy Spirit, please come and teach us, O oh Lord. I pray you will bring illumination to the scriptures, especially to the words of Jesus. I pray also, Lord, that you will lead me and empower me and guide me even as I share this. And I pray also for the hearts of those listening in, whether here or listening on the recording. Father, we just pray a blessing upon all these, and we ask that you teach us and you guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight's topic is an interesting one, and I think it's definitely a relevant one. It remains relevant for a long time, and it, especially in our present days, uh, we have to be careful how we understand this passage that we're getting into. Of course, you know we are talking about false prophets, and we know that Jesus warned the church or his disciples often about these false prophets. We're not just going to jump in and talk about the topic or the issue without understanding the context. Whatever we are reading, I think it's always important that we must remind ourselves it falls within a larger context. So it's not just about false prophets per se. It's not these few verses that we pick out. Let's remember that we are getting into, or we have gotten already into, the Sermon on the Mount, the final section. Last lesson, we started this final section, and today is a second installment. The next one will be third, and then finally the fourth one, Jesus then concludes. But I want you to remember that it is about the Sermon on the Mount. Many times when we quote a passage, we will look at those verses and then we'll try to understand it by itself without the entire picture, and we find that it's very difficult to understand, or we sort of impose certain things upon it which may or may not be correct. So we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and right now, in that final section, Jesus, if you remember, gives a choice. There's a broad way, and there's a narrow way, and you have to enter it through either a broad gate or a narrow gate, you have a choice, you have a decision to make. But he doesn't stop there. After he finishes that teaching, immediately the next verse, Jesus cautions. He says, now you have a choice. But as you choose, however, whichever way you choose, and especially if you choose correctly, here I am, I'm going to caution you. If you want to choose correctly, something is going to happen down there. And then there's a consequence which we will explore in the next teaching. And finally, a conclusion. Keep this really in your heart and in your mind. It's not a few verses that we're trying to understand. It's a few verses in the context of the entire entire sermon. So let's read the text now, now that I've given you a bigger picture. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. The king issues a caution and a warning about false prophets. His very first word is, beware. Look out for these guys. In the NIV, you have those two words, watch out. Now, in the original text, it is from this word called prosecco, which means to pay attention, pay careful heed, be very, very concerned. It is a nautical term. It means to hold a ship in a direction so that it can sail towards the destination and reach that destination. Put it another way, it's, it means to hold steady to a course that you have taken, right? It's to stay on track. It's to keep to the way. Does it sound familiar? Right? And I find this interesting because two verses before, Jesus is saying, hey, There is a broad gate and it leads to a broad way. Now, if you choose that way, you've already gone into the wrong place. But there is a narrow gate that will lead you to a narrow way. Now, if you are going to choose this narrow path, guess what? Beware. Prosecco. Pay attention. Stay on track. Keep to this way. Because there will come people 
who will want to make you veer. They will distract you. They will want to pull you away from this correct way. They want to entice you to get off this track. You have got to be careful. You have to pay attention so that you can keep to this way, which is, which is that narrow way towards the destination which leads you what? To life, to what the kingdom of God really is all about. See, we don't read this in context. We miss the picture. We just start with, oh, who are the false prophets? Uh? Who are these guys? Uh? I, I don't really, you know. And, and, and then we're just trying to identify this. No, no. Look, if you are not even walking on in the narrow way, identify pro- false prophets for what? Nobody's going to lead you anywhere because you have already led yourself somewhere wrong. But if you look at the narrow way and the narrow gate by which you have entered and you want to stay on this way, careful, beware. You can bet your last dollar there will be people who will come to drag you away from the correct path. These are the false prophets. And the Greek, is, it sounds like the English. It's a pseudo-prophetess. You know this word pseudo, right? Pseudo just means false. Not the real thing. These are wolves. These are wolves that would pull you away. And the interesting observation is, the wolves are not out there. The wolves are amongst the sheep. Right? That's what Jesus says. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They are not out there. They are already in the flock. They will get amongst you to try to veer you and to lure you away. Another observation is this. Outwardly, wolf in sheep's clothing. Outwardly, they look and they talk the same. They sound exactly like the sheep. Uh, Yeah, they, they will mimic it really well. Outwardly, they look and they talk and they sound the same. But inwardly, they are of a different nature. But it's very hard to tell because if they look the same, they talk the same, you lift up hands, they lift up hands, you say hallelujah, they say praise the Lord. You can't tell them apart. But Jesus says, the only way to identify and to expose these will be by their fruits. You've got to look at their fruits and we will identify these a bit later. We'll address this point to see how we can do that. And so you're trying to walk this way and Jesus says, you be careful, but they look the same, they sound the same. Now, how would you know? How would you know who is then telling the truth? You will only know if you yourselves will first know what the truth is. You will only know how to spot someone that is fake or that is false if you first understand in the first place what a prophet is and the function of the prophet. If you don't know this, what measure do you have, right? You have got no bearing. You can't compare to anything. Your experiences might even fool you. And so let's start with a little bit of a foundation and ask ourselves, so what is a prophet. If I don't know what a prophet is, I won't know what a false prophet is all about. Now, simply a prophet is a seer. He, he or she can see things. In the Old Testament, they use that term, a seer, a man of God. Most fundamentally, he's a speaker. Now, not just a speaker that speaks for himself. He's a spokesperson for a deity. In other words, Israel or God's people, they were not the only one who had prophets. Other gods of other lands, they also had their own prophets. These were spokespeople for the deity. A prophet is also both a foreteller as well as a foreteller. There are these two things that are important, two functions. Now, what's a foreteller? A foreteller is someone who sees into the future before things happen, and they they bring it to light. That's what the word means. So he tells something ahead of time and is able to talk about and share with you events and occurrences that are to come. But it's not just a foreteller. You see, many times in our Christian thinking even, the moment we talk about prophetic or prophet, we always think about, tell me the future, right? It's not just about that. A prophet has the other function also as a forth teller. In other words, he speaks forth. What he hears from God, 
He speaks forth. Now, it can be something in the future, or it can be something now, or it can be something in the past where God shows him, and then he decrees that. But it's not something that he just speaks according to his own fancy or liking. What the king tells him, he speaks it according to the word of God. What the king shows him, he speaks it according to the will and also the ways of the king. Now, if you would imagine or reflect and think about the Old Testament, so many prophetic books, if you would read the words that they use and they declare, do you realize they are actually prophesying and decreeing the word of God and the law of God usually found in Deuteronomy and, of course, the first five books? They are very consistent where that's concerned. So it's not just a foretelling, it is also a foretelling. What's the purpose of these two things, foretelling and foretelling? Well, for one, I think we better tell ourselves and remind ourselves, it's not fortune-telling. You know, today we have the Christian equivalent uh, of Kuan Di, you know, fortune-telling. It's not for that purpose. The purpose of prophecy is to direct God's people back into God's ways and onto God's will. That's that purpose of the prophet. That's why God sent the prophets over. Now, oh, but how about future events? No, it's not for crystal ball gazing. Future events are really to tell the people and to comfort and to encourage the people to say, hey, this is what's going to happen, all right? You may be going through a very difficult time at this point in time, okay? It may, be, it may be tough for you. It may be uncomfortable for you. But this is the right way. If, if you are walking the right way, huh? Jesus never said it would be easy, right? If you're walking the correct way, things may not go as well as you would like it to be. The prophetic voice comes and says, you know, will you hang on? Will you stay on course? Because in the end, it's going to be okay. God comforts you. God encourages you because there's always a future hope. Now, but sometimes the future events are not pretty pictures, right? We read in the Old Testament, you know, it, there's, there's fire, there's judgment and so on. Now, the future scenes of judgment were not to condemn God's people. You know God is a loving God, amen. God is a gracious God, amen. And I say it often, often. You know why He shows you the judgment scenes or He tells you the things that are not so nice to hear? It's so that you can make the right decisions because you don't want to end up in that place. There are consequences, and the scenes of future judgment is not to condemn people and make people feel lousy. It's to help them make godly choices. Jesus, the prophet of all prophets, he tells you very clearly, look guys, there's a narrow gate and there's a broad gate. The broad one goes to the broad way, leads to destruction and death. But the correct one will lead to life. Now you choose. See, the prophets are exactly the same. They will tell you, come on, it's either this or it's this. Guys, you have a choice to make. Don't make the prophet out to be this bad guy, you know, come on, you know, uh, you know, say only bad things. That's not the whole idea of prophecy. The purpose of prophecy, as I shared, is not about condemnation, but it's to also make clear how God's people may have been misaligned or they have been disobedient. The prophets will always declare and decree based on the Word of God, the law. And these were all empowered by the Holy Spirit. You cannot tell me the prophets were not moving by the Spirit of God. Every prophet recorded was anointed by the Holy Spirit to decree the things of the King. And because they are empowered by God's Spirit correctly, I am very confident they never ministered out of the letter of the law, but they ministered always by the Spirit of the law. Will you agree with me based on that, right? And sometimes we, look, we read Old Testament and then we just categorize it. Everything Old Testament is bad. New Testament is all good. No, the prophets moved by the Spirit of God. Do you know, there are many accounts where the prophets' hearts were recorded to be broken as they cried and they wept for the people and their condition. I mean, if they ministered by the letter of the law, they couldn't care less whether you live or you die. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet crying for the people of God. When he saw Jerusalem devastated and desolate, he cried. It's a, it's a spirit of God and he's just appealing and cajoling and beseeching and say, come on guys, come on guys. I'm telling you like it is, but you have to choose. 
They were compassionate people. They were trying to woo the people back onto God's path. But they never compromised. They presented the choices and the consequences. The funny thing is this. They never compromised. And it is often they release these things at their own peril. Because when they said everything clearly and precisely, the people didn't want to listen to them. They got upset with them. And many of them were persecuted. Some will look at the New Testament and say, oh, no, 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 but the New Testament is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 1 to 4 tells us, it's to edify, it's to exhort, it's to comfort. They're all positive words. So prophetic uh, cannot say bad things. One, I don't want to say bad things. The word edify means to build up. Amen or not? You can't build on wrong foundation. If the prophet wants to give you a word to build you up, he's also going to tell you a word that will remove a wrong foundation so that you can be built up correctly. See, many times we look at the New Testament and we just categorize it again. Like I said, New Testament, very nice. Old Testament, very bad. That's a wrong understanding. Now, if you don't understand the prophets and you don't understand the role and the function of the prophet, guess what? You will define the prophetic for yourself. And if you're going to define it for yourself, you're going to open yourself up to a lot of interpretation and possibly also deception. Let's look at the Old Testament a little bit. In the Old Testament, there were many false prophets. Jesus didn't have to explain false prophets to the disciples, right? He just stood there and he says on the sermon, Hello guys, be careful, beware, got these false prophets. And I think the Jews would have understood it. The disciples would have read historical accounts they would have already a a notion or or an inkling of what these false prophets are. So let's look at at least a couple of them to understand how these false prophets uh, operated in those days. In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 6, 400 prophets, not one, not two, not five, not ten, 400, they declare victory for King Ahab. King Ahab asked them, shall I go into battle, win or lose, tell me. And the 400 prophets tell the king, No worries, you just go, you're going to have victory. Now, King Jehoshaphat, thank God for him, he asked King Ahab, he said, well, okay, 400, okay, may I have a second opinion? How do you like that, right? It's not, may I have a second opinion, may I have have a 401st opinion? Somehow, it doesn't sit well with me. This 400 guys, everyone saying, it's going to be okay. Ahab says this, well, there is still one man. His name is Micaiah. He's the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I'll be honest with you, I hate him. Because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. So Jehoshaphat looked at him and said, Hey, let not the king say such things. Thank God for Jehoshaphat, right? And so reluctantly, Ahab gets Micaiah and says, Okay, prophesy. And Micaiah says, Well, okay, the foreigners say, Win, right? Okay, win, win, you want to win, win, I paraphrase, yeah? And then King Ahab looks at him and says, Hey, hello, you tell the truth, huh? You prophet, you know? And then Micaiah looks at him and says, You're going to die. It's not going to be good. Ahab gets out into battle, he dies. Can you see? Ahab might be like one of us, or we might have been like Ahab. We are very much like Ahab. Oh, I don't like this prophet. He only says bad things about me. I want the good ones. And I'll look for 400 good ones to tell me the good things. The second example is this prophet called Hananiah. And we find him in the book of Jeremiah. Now you know Jeremiah has already told the people to say, guys, you're going to be taken out of Jerusalem, out of the land. Okay, you've been naughty. God has given you time and time and time opportunity to repent and you have not. This is how long you're going to spend out of the land. 70 years. You're going to have 70 years in exile. Hananiah steps up and prophesies, nope. The yoke of the king of Babylon will be broken in two years. In two years, you're going to be brought back to this land. God exposes Hananiah as a false prophet. Jeremiah says 70. It's going to be 70. And a couple of months, Hananiah dies. Just like that. See, it's always good stuff. You get this idea? The false prophets will want to say things to sort of appease the people. There are many other references. You can go to the prophetic books. They warn the people... Be careful of false prophets. Be careful, be careful, be careful. We get to the New Testament and you'll see certain references. Remember once again, the New Testament writers only had the Hebrew Scriptures as their Bible. 
So in other words, I believe their understanding of the prophetic would also be the same. When, we, when they say false prophets, they understand what they're talking about. Jesus in Matthew 24 warns the people again. There will be false Christs and there will be false prophets. They will arise and they will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Paul, to the elders in Ephesus before he left, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 31, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, verse 29 is the one that you want to underline, that after my departure, savage wolves, sound familiar? Savage wolves will come in among you, and these wolves will not spare the flock. They come in, they won't spare the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. What do I keep telling all of us? Love the blessings, heed the warnings. Love the blessings, heed the warnings. If you only love the blessings, you are lopsided. Because like Paul, he says, I warn you every day and night with tears. I'm warning you, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Love the blessings, heed the warnings. You find it in 2 Peter chapter 2 also, in verses 1 to 3. But there were also false prophets among the people. There were, even as there will be, false teachers among you. And they will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And for some of them, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Peter is stating very clearly, right? There's not going to be a nice end for these people. The question is, which way are you following? Amen? Which way are you following? Now, in the New Testament, we look at this word, false prophets, but there are variations on a theme when we look at other titles of these false prophets. I believe Jesus was referring to the same thing when he says false prophets. We see also false apostles, as well as false evangelists, false pastors, as well as false teachers. Now, you'll find these references in the Bible. Let me just throw this at you. I want you to consider this so that when you look at this word, false prophets, I believe is the entire category. You've got to be careful with all these people. False apostles. Paul warns the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And he gives a warning. He said, it's not surprising, it's no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end right at the end, okay, will be according to their works. There will be false apostles. They will come and they will be... I mean, Paul had to battle many of these even in his days. That's why he had to prove himself to say, I'm that true apostle. The people were looking at these other apostles who were supposed to be more impressive, more charismatic, who preach much better, much more attractive. And Paul says, look, I, I come not in this kind of a power. I'm not, I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been this. You know, I didn't eat and I have no food. I got no money. But it's okay. I'm happy to be a fool for Jesus Christ. The people were gravitating towards those who were supposed to be more attractive than Paul. False apostles, same as false prophets. The next you see is false evangelists. Why do I say this? Because in that same passage a little bit earlier, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says that these would preach another Jesus. They will have a different spirit. They will bring a different gospel, a different good news. Now, the word evangelist just means someone who brings the good news. So if they bring a different good news, which means it will be a false good news, which means that they are false evangelists. Are you following? 
there will be false pastors. We don't have these words in the New Testament, but Jesus did warn us. He says, you be careful of hirelings. These are not real guys. They will look after you. They are like salaried workers. But the moment got problem, they run. When the wolves come, they don't want to say anything. Nothing, nothing. It's okay. You know, or the wolves come, they just run away. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. You better follow me. Don't look for these hirelings because they, they don't have your hearts in their concern. And I call them, broadly, these are the false pastors, right? They don't really care too much about the flock. Lastly, false teachers, where Peter talks about them. They bring destructive heresies. They twist scriptures. And they teach people all kinds of things. Now, I'm sharing this with you, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like a verse that Paul would have written to the church in Ephesus? He says that when Christ ascended, he gave gifts, right? That he gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, Jesus gives the real stuff. But there will be the bluff stuff. Because where there's truth, there will always be a counterfeit. There's a battle that's going on. Are you following? Right? So not everything is as it seems. And I want you to know, it's not just false prophet. The false prophet can come by, by a different title. Right? If they want to bluff you, they, they don't have to use the same title. They can call themselves something else even. It's not so much a title these days. You have to ask yourself, what are the characteristics? What do you see? What are their motives? Now, whether Old Testament or New Testament, this would be a list of characteristics or motives of these false guys or false ministers. They presume to speak for God. Okay, they will say, thus says the Lord, or this is what the Lord is saying to you, or da-da-da-da-da. Okay, and that's very, very, very common these days. They presume to speak for God. Usually, it will be for personal gain. They would be prideful, and they are covetous because they are wanting more for themselves. Their motive is to please men, not to please God. In the Old Testament, they practiced divination, which means that they, was, they, they sought other sources of inspiration. And by those powers, they were able also to perform signs and wonders. Now, in today's New Age understanding, there are ministers who also get into the New Age. And there are certain practices in the church that also sound very New Age and other Eastern religion influence. They are accompanied by signs and wonders. They give false and deceptive dreams and visions. This is the rave these days. It's dreams and visions, visions and dreams. Now, which is correct, which is not? They are not concerned about things and the ways of God. They are not concerned about the state or the welfare of God's people. Their key is to is to devour, to, to exploit the people. Whatever you can give to this person, they'll be happy to take. Okay, they are not interested in you, they are interested in yours. They presume the covenant status of God's people, that nothing bad will happen to them, regardless how they lived. Did you hear that? It's like, you're God's people, no, nothing bad will happen to you. Everything will be good one. You can just live the way you want to live. You can, you can just sin and it's all right. It doesn't matter because you're God's covenant people. God will keep the covenant no matter what. And that's what the false prophets told the people of Israel. They only focus on the blessings. They, they never gave any warnings. Their desire is to draw people themselves. And as they draw people to themselves, they actually draw people away from God and His ways but in the guise of them walking in God's ways. See, this is how sneaky the whole thing is. I don't know why Jesus calls them wolves. They should have been foxes. Their interpretation of Scripture is also questionable. And they'll twist the Scripture according to how they want to understand it or would they like you to understand it. See, these are the characteristics. Now, if you don't understand uh, these things, you, you can't spot any of these for yourself to be careful. So we understand about prophets, we looked at their functions, we studied a little bit about the Old Testament, we saw some New Testament references, and we said, okay, these are the characters. So, so how do we know? How do we identify these false ministers or false prophets? Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. 
Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? If you want to draw grapes, right, you, you, you better look for this tree properly or this, this plant or this vine. Even so, every tree will bear good fruit. A bad tree will bear bad fruit. Good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Bad tree cannot bear good fruit. I mean, Jesus was repeating and giving permutations of how you want to see it. The point is, look for this fruit. You've got to see what this fruit is. What was Jesus referring to? Was he referring to the fruit of character? Whether this person is mature, whether his spirituality or spiritual understanding is of a certain level. Is it about spiritual maturity and character? Well, yes, I think you should look out for this. This will be your first cut, okay? If this person is not living according to uh, how Jesus is talking about in his own character, and if it's questionable, I think you have to be careful. We're not saying perfect, but I think you've got to look at these things. It's good, it is important, but can I submit to you, this is also not foolproof. It's a funny thing. Remember, these wolves are dressed in sheep's clothing. They can be very nice, they can be very charming, and they can be very convincing. If they know how to wayang, they know how to wayang. Right? Because they are, they are play acting. It's very possible if you don't understand this person up close. And today with internet and uh, long distance learning kind of stuff, right? You know? I mean, let's say for example, people listen to Kingdom 101. Oh, they get excited by their teaching. I'm happy. I'm encouraged. Now their view of this guy who's teaching might be positive. But he, doesn't, he or she doesn't know how I live, whether I, I beat my wife. I, I don't beat my wife, by the way. <laughs> You know, or, 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 or I'm a, just a terrible father or, you know, the, the guy doesn't know. Can you see this? Yeah? And so, well, this is a good indicator, but it's not foolproof. How about the fruit of ministry? The fruit of ministry. Is this person's ministry having the right influence and having the right impact? And people can be touched and people can be uh, impacted in a certain way to live for Jesus. And people can be excited and they can be on fire after listening to some of the messages and say, well, I've been so set free. Well, good, praise the Lord. You know, it's wonderful to hear all those things. But at the same time, if this guy has a big following, a good following, a large following doesn't mean a right following. That's another problem. So if you're looking at a ministry in terms of numbers, it's not accurate again, right? Big doesn't mean healthy. Okay, big in sometimes can mean very unhealthy. And churches now with the focus on numbers and ministries, focusing on who is there with them and, you know, oh, we're opening this and, this and that. Well, numbers are nice. But numbers would not be everything, would you agree? Okay, so you've got to also look, is it also, is it the fruit of character? Good, not foolproof, you better be careful. Is it the fruit of ministry? Well, praise the Lord, yeah, okay. For some things, yes, but again, not, 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 not foolproof. The third one I think is very key. I call it the fruit of fulfillment. The fruit of prophetic fulfillment. And this is the Deuteronomy chapter 18 test. You find this in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 to 22. The Lord said to Moses, What they have spoken is good. That's from verse 17. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall be that whoever does not or will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Now we know this is talking about the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So question to ask. Did the prophecy come to pass? If it's a foretelling, if the person is talking about something that's going to that's gonna come somewhere in the future, did the prophecy come to pass? Now, my observation these days is that much of the prophecies we hear tend to be very broad stroke. They're very general. 
very general prophetic words these days. Oh, this is blah, 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 you know, this will be like this, this will be like that. And 20 situations can, can fit into that very broad pronouncement. Okay? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that it's hard to tell. There's also very little accountability. Some have been a little bit more specific to name names and to set dates, you know, and to, to, to describe certain situations. And when these things never happened or didn't come to pass, no one calls these prophets or so-called prophets to account. Am I correct? The moment a prophecy is released, and today in the internet is share, 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 share. But when it didn't come to pass after five or ten years and that person is still alive, there's no word that goes out to say it was wrong, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And then we can share that also and so that, okay, fine, you know, we are, we're holding one another accountable, but don't have. Because by then, another 3,000 prophecies have come forth again. Can you see this? And because there's no accountability, whether these big-name prophets or small-timer prophets, you know, when I say small-time, I mean in the body, you know, we do prophetic ministry, you know. Because there's no accountability, the demand remains very high because God's people have become prophecy chasers. Why do you think we have a greater attendance tonight? Because we're talking about prophecy. Oh, come on, amen. Right, we, we want to know. Yeah, we want to be careful, of course. Thank you for being here. But really, you, you hold a prophetic meeting, it's going to be full. And the joke is you hold a prayer meeting, you pray really hard that they, they'll come. People have become prophecy chasers. And we like it because really it's the Christian version of fortune telling. I'm happy if you have a prophetic word. and I've been guided by prophecy over and over again. My question for us as our keepers is, if you are really serious about prophecy and if a personal word is given to you, what are you doing with the prophecy? What are you doing with the word or the words that you have collected, the cassettes, last time cassettes, to the digital recorders, to now your iPhone recorders. What are you doing with all these words? Okay, nothing wrong with prophecy. The people don't become prophecy chasers. There's a difference also between a false prophecy and a wrong prophecy. A false prophecy, of course, has an intent to mislead. A wrong prophecy is where the prophet or the one ministering prophetically has full intention to hear as best as he can from the Lord and to release as accurately as he, he deems to have heard. Okay, I'm using words very carefully. Yeah? But can he get it wrong? Possible, right? And I can tell you, sometimes in my, in my best intentions, I release something that didn't come to pass. I assure you, I'm not a false prophet. Okay. <laughs> And I, I want to learn. I want to be careful about that. Nathan was God's prophet to David, King David. Nathan got it wrong, right? David wanted to build a temple for God. And Nathan says, yeah, okay, no problem. You know, the Lord was as happy with that. Go, go ahead. He spoke on behalf of God. He walked halfway out and the Lord tells him, sorry, huh, bro, wrong one. Not bro, sorry, yeah, son, wrong one. He turns back and tells David, you're not going to build it. You're going to lay up, Solomon's going to build it. Am I right? You see, he's willing to, to acknowledge, and he's wrong, he'll, he'll change it. So there's a difference between a false prophecy and a wrong prophecy. Our part, and I don't want you to leave with this wrong understanding, our part is not to reject prophecy after this. Our part is to test prophecy for ourselves. Did you hear that? Our part is not to reject the prophetic. Our part is to test the prophetic. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Paul is not saying hold fast to the good parts of the prophecy. That's not the point. Hold fast what is good, i.e. what is the ways of God, what is righteous, what's correct. Test prophecies. Don't despise prophecies. Don't have a crutch on the prophetic your entire life. By that, I'm not saying don't ever go for a prophetic word. The problem with many of God's people is that we're too lazy to read the word and to seek the Lord for ourselves. That's the truth. We are too lazy to do all these things. It's easier to line up, oh, but we're not lazy to line up for two hours. Right? 
And then the, the guy lays hand on you, gives you a word. I mean, like I said, wonderful if it's correct. But what do you do after that with it? See, it's always easier for someone to tell you something than for you to posture before the Lord. And we have become, let me say this as gently as I can, we have become prophetic parasites. We, we just leech on, you know. It's like, no. I don't think that's correct. Now, I tell people, look, I, I, I love the prophetic. But I don't run to every one of these. Now, if you're a young Christian and your first time being exposed to someone, it's, it's very exciting. And it's like, wow, you know, this guy's so correct, so tuned, you know. Then go out one more time, test one more time. You know, go to another one, test one more time. You know? Let's see how, you know. And some Christians are very clever, you know? I don't want to tell him. I just go and see whether he's correct or not. Then he's a true prophet. <laughs> it's okay for that. But if you want to mature, then you learn how to hear because God then can use you as a prophetic voice. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits. Today we are lapping up everything. Lock, stock, barrel. As long as it feels good, feels right, then it cannot be wrong, right? I mean, do you know how many people have gone wrong feeling it's right? The fruit of prophetic fulfillment. I think that's important. For the major ones, big world events, all that, let's watch it, let's listen, hold it carefully, don't despise it, watch it, see whether it moves on. For those that are personal to you, you know best. But if this person is just spewing things over you and it doesn't come through, then I think you have to be very careful. But over and above all these things, all these are important. The Deuteronomy 18 test is very important. But it's all based on what I call now the, the, the consistency of Scripture. Is the prophecy rightly aligned with the Word of God? God-led prophets will always be consistent with God's Word. Now this doesn't mean that we all agree with every interpretation that we have. But the, the fundamentals cannot be compromised. But then you need to know the fundamentals. If you don't know the fundamentals, how do you know if someone is just throwing some, some hog wash at you? You won't know. Is the prophet cherry-picking in the way they teach the pastors, the evangelists, all that? Are they cherry-picking or is it the full counsel of God? Before Paul warned the Ephesians about the savage wolves coming after his departure, in verse 27 of Acts chapter 20, he says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole council, not one topic that you like, not this part where, you know, makes you feel good, not only that part, you know, that motivates and inspires you, the whole council of God. In other words, he's saying, I'm declaring the entire truth to you. The challenge for us, friends, is that let's not be satisfied with a half-truth. You know, a half-truth will lead you into a lie. If you're only presented half a picture, you've got to be very careful. If it's always cookies and creams, please be careful. This is not the full picture. Love the blessings. Heed the warnings. Is it rightly aligned with Scripture and with the Word, obviously with the Word of God? Let's stay in context. Do you still remember we are going through the Sermon on the Mount? And these verses fall within the Sermon on the Mount. That means Jesus is saying, there will be false prophets who will come. They will speak against everything I've said in this sermon. He's very precise. See, sometimes when we say false prophets, we look at those three verses without the context. We are wondering, oh dear, what, what do I measure? How do I, what's my, where's the benchmark? But if you look at it in this whole context on the Sermon on the Mount, suddenly there is a benchmark. It's very, very clear. You've got to ask yourself, through the course of the teaching, through the course of the ministry, through the course of the influence of the messages that you're hearing, ask yourself, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? And what do these say? Would that be helpful? Go back and review. For example, in the Beatitudes, one of which Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew version. Luke version, blessed are those who are poor. What do these guys say? Blessed are the rich. Can you see the, the, the problem here? Right? 
we're not saying that being rich is a wrong thing, but if that's an indicator of God's blessing, this is not what Jesus says. So immediately, you've got to ding, 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 wolf alert, wolf alert. I'm not saying this is a wolf, but you better smell, smell this person a little bit. Yeah? A little bit closer. Is the snout a bit long or not from the sheep? Are you following? But you know what's our problem? We like what they say. Blessed are the rich. So who cares what Jesus says? Can you see the misalignment? Right here, Jesus says, Blessed are the persecuted. What do these guys say? Persecuted? Ah, yeah. That means you believe wrong. Lah. Cannot. Lah. You are richly blessed, highly favoured. How can you be persecuted? Ding, ding, ding. Wolf alert. Is this simple enough? Jesus then says, the law must be interpreted correctly. I'm summarizing, right? I'm paraphrasing. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Eh? I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The law must be interpreted correctly. What do these say? No need law anymore. So interpret for what? Jesus says, you deal with your lust and you deal with your anger. They say, it's okay. God's grace will always overlook that. Can you see there's a problem in the way we are interpreting things and seeing things and hearing things? Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, in the Disciples' Prayer, the Kingdom Prayer, forgive and my Father in Heaven will forgive you. Those were His words. What do they say? Oh, that was before He died. Now don't you already? You're all forgiven. Jesus says, learn how to judge correctly. They say, never, never judge at all. Jesus says, don't be covetous. They say, ask God for more. No? No, there's nothing wrong with having good things. Amen? But the principle is don't be covetous. But today's gospel teaches us to be dissatisfied with what we have. Jesus said, ask for the Holy Spirit. They say, ask for anything you want. <laughs> Jesus says, the way of the kingdom is difficult. They say, Jesus did the difficult part so you can have it easy. Jesus said, few. They say, many. No, no. Who's right? Obviously, you and I will say Jesus, right? But who's more attractive? They sound better, right? More palatable, don't you think? But who would you listen to? Are you catching the principles, my friends? You have a benchmark. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. If you only take these three, four, five verses and pull it out, then obviously you don't know how to measure. You've got nothing to measure against. And they will always pander to your flesh. And two verses earlier, Jesus says, don't look for the broad gate. And we've already settled in the last teaching. That's the flesh gate. You've got to go by the filter of the spirit gate. That's a narrow gate. You know why few find it? Because they don't want to look for it. The flesh gate is very easy because everything, according to our flesh, we feel good. And it will capitalize based on that. I want to end with something that will help you, I hope. Jesus says, beware of false prophets. And I know we've been focusing on the false prophet, but I want to add one phrase. Beware of false prophets, but take heed to yourself. Don't keep looking at the false prophets and you forget your own part that you need to play. In Ezekiel chapter 14, in the passage verses 3 to 7, let me read verse 4 for you. Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his hearts and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. When I read this passage, it's like, wow. It really made me read it again. I said, Lord, Lord, wait, hang on. These guys are coming to the prophets to ask for something, but they have idols in their heart and you will answer them. See, false prophets are not the only ones to blame. We asked for it. Like these, we still have idols in our hearts. We have our agenda, our desires are all still very selfish. 
And the truth is, Jesus is not ruling and He's not reigning as king. We have all these idols, we have all these other things that are pulling us all over our path. And if we only focus on these things, we are misaligned. And what's in this mind, this, this fleshly heart of ours? We want to have our cake and eat it. Who says amen? Agree? We want to have our cake and eat it. Now, if we are like that, then we will come to the man or the woman of God or the people of God, as it were. Just like these people, the elders came to Ezekiel, said, you, you seek the Lord for us. We will then seek out what we want to hear to justify how we want to live. Did you hear that one? We will seek out what we want to hear to justify how we want to live. Now, Paul already prophesied about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to these fables. We will pick out the people that we like to hear because they are saying the things that, that, that resonate with us. That's the Christian buzzword also. When prophets and teachers tell us we can continue without changing and we will still be blessed and prosperous, that sounds really good. And we love it. I'm quoting from Scripture, Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 to 31. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. It's scriptural. We want to hear what we want to hear. And we are answered according to our idols. God says that, look, buy their idols, whatever they want, they're asking, I want some. But that's what it is. We are answered according to our idols. And they say, then that's not fair, God. You know, shouldn't you stop me? I said, no, it's totally fair. He's already stated the choice for you. It's either this or it's this. Yes or no? It's either the narrow or the broad. It's very clearly stated. It's all there. The consequences are also there. In other words, God's people should already know that if a word should just be given, it's to be testing us, do we choose correctly? We are answered according to our idols. But friends, we are judged by our choice. We are answered according to our idols, but we are judged by our choice. The prophets are there. The false prophets are there as a test. If we would choose correctly and wisely. But if we choose according to our flesh, then we will receive according to how we have chosen and how we have asked. This is it. It's very clear. And so my word to us all is this. Don't just blame the prophets. Take heed to yourself. Don't blame them. Don't keep pointing out at them. Don't go on a witch hunt. That is not our task in that sense. Huh? We have to be careful. We have to beware. But unless the Lord tells you specifically, you know, go hunt that prophet down. <laughs> then that's your assignment. Unless He tells you that, I don't want you to be distracted by a wrong assignment. Amen? We're talking about false things. I don't want you to get onto a false assignment. I want you to be on a true kingdom assignment. Say amen with me. Amen. Don't go on a witch hunt. It is to protect you so that you can stay true to the way and be on your assignment. I want to encourage you this evening. If you have been misguided, misaligned, you know, a prophecy chaser. Okay, don't use the word prophecy parasite. Not nice, huh? Would you, would you repent? You understand? Would you repent? Would you, would you return to the Lord the right way? Huh? Would you realign? Would you realign? Come back. You see, don't blame the prophets. Huh? They are accountable for how they prophesy. You are accountable for how you live. They are accountable for how they prophesy, how they teach, how they pastor, and how they do whatever they need to be doing. You are accountable for how you do what you need to be doing. And so where's the booth? Let's close. If you were hoping that I would 
have called out false prophets and named certain names, I'm sorry that I won't be doing that for tonight. That's not my place. I have my own opinions. I have my own concerns about certain names. You can talk to me. We can discuss. We can dialogue. But I don't think this is the place to share it because we have to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Not every case or not every person is as clear-cut. Hence the need for us to learn, for us to know personally how to discern so that we ourselves can identify wolves from amongst the sheep. But stay in the context, okay? Stay in the context. There's a choice. Jesus has presented now the caution. Now, if we still choose wrongly, the next session is about the consequence, so don't miss that one. And finally, we conclude. Measure every prophet and every prophetic word against the words of Jesus, our King. Now, you and I know that not all wolves would look like this, so fierce or so scary, right? Some actually, some wolves actually look quite good, you know, like this one. Yeah, they, they look like Wolverine, right? Huh? Of the X-Men. It's like, wow. I mean, so cute, you know. So dashing. And they may even appear as superheroes who will save the day. Friends, don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Jesus has given the caution and a choice needs to be made. Who would you follow? The Wolverine or the Nazarene? That's your choice. Which would you choose? If you look at the pictures, one looks really dashing, the other one has been through a bashing. See, don't be fooled by the things of this world, the attractive symbols, the power symbols of our world. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not about having long blades coming out of your hands. It's about understanding the long nails that went into his hands. The kingdom is upside down. The gate to enter by is narrow. The way to walk by is narrow. But Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus the Christ, Jesus our King tells us it leads to life. Beware of wolves. Learn to follow the shepherd. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. Lord, you are our King. You are our Master. Lord, you have spoken things very clearly. You've made it black and white. Choice A, choice B, you've presented it clearly to us. Lord, we ask your forgiveness that often we hear your words, but we look to someone else because it sounds more attractive. Lord, we, we know the Christian jargon. We know the pictures. We've heard it from Sunday school. We've heard it in the churches. But when we get out into the world, the decisions that we make... Lord, we confess, Lord, we, we pick the easier option most of the time. We pick the option that panders to our flesh, Lord, and we ask your forgiveness. But Lord, this evening as we have heard your word, we thank you, Lord, that you have shown us, you have warned us, and you have, you have taught us how to identify these. Lord, Holy Spirit, will you guide us? It's not altogether clear and easy at times. Lord, will you show us? Will you teach us? Lord, will you bring brothers and sisters who will walk alongside all of us so that we can correct one another, we can be accountable to each other? Lord, if we have veered, Lord, we have, if we have chased after prophets, celebrities, Lord, will you forgive us because you're the only one we want to follow? And so help us to journey, Lord. Help us to realign. Help us to walk by the spirit gate, Lord, the narrow gate to walk that narrow way, knowing that you journey with us every step, every step of this way. We're going to follow you, Lord, because we love you. You gave your life for us, Lord, and you're going to lead us to the right destination. Thank you, Lord. May we learn to apply this well. May we learn what is necessary. We will be careful of false prophets, but we promise to take heed to ourselves. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.